three schools on this afternoon's safari, and that's the Bartlett School and Fairfield and Newcastle Elementary. It is wonderful to have you guys with us, so please send through as many questions as you guys can, and not only myself, but also Ralph and Taylor, who are up in Kenya, will also be able to answer as many questions as possible. Now, it's a very, very hot afternoon here in South Africa and it's about 36 degrees Celsius which is around close on 100 degrees Fahrenheit so my plans are to head to a few water holes in the hope that we will find some animals coming down to not only quench their thirst but some of them actually like to swim and roll around in the mud elephants buffalo rhino and warthog are four animals that all like to wallow in the muddy water holes so I'm hoping we're gonna get lucky and see them doing that other than that, though, anything is possible. We could bump into anything along the way. Where we are here is a very good place to see leopard as well as lion. And where Ralph and Taylor are up in Kenya, it's a very good place to see lion and cheetah. And even though you do see cheetah here and you do also see leopard up there, I think that's kind of the main difference, but one of the main differences between the predators that we get to see in the two different areas that we are exploring. You'll also notice the vegetation here is very thick and out in the mara, it's very open grass. So you're going to have a great safari, I'm sure, because there's nobody else who can go on safari in two places at the same time, other than people who are with us on Safari Live. And it sounds like you guys are going to head straight up to Kenya to go and see what Taylor is getting up to with some lions. I hope that they aren't sleeping, but in all likelihood they are. <laughs> I think you have a lucky charm, Scott, because as you said that the lion popped her head up. Welcome to, of course, all of the wonderful children who have joined us on this school drive adventure. I'm looking forward to you all asking me lots of questions and jumping back on board with me. My name is Taylor and on camera with me is Manu, bringing you all the most amazing wildlife. But there's not just one lion here, there's actually a second one too. Now maybe this is the first time you're seeing a lion in the wild. How cool is that? How cool is it that I get to do this every single day? Now it's just these two girls here, so we will call them lioness and I cannot see any big males, any big boys and there are a few male lions around here that uh, do come past and visit the ladies and they're looking quite excited now the weather is starting to change it has been so hot today in the Masai Mara so we're in Kenya, we're not in South Africa like Scott we're in a completely different country and now that the wind is picking up it's actually going to be very very good hunting weather for these lions this wind is going to help them they'll be able to move a little bit quicker their scent will be hidden and i think that question was from scott and you're wondering if it's supposed to rain so not scott tom there we go i just missed that sorry tom um normally it rains every afternoon out here doesn't actually feel like it's going to rain right now. Uh, it's not particularly humid and they don't look like there's any rain clouds building up directly above us but with the wind picking up it could quite easily blow in some big cumulonimbus clouds or nimbostratus clouds that are typically rain clouds and then we'll have to zip up and go into the tent uh, to be able to keep nice and dry. Look at those cool birds, those are called cattle egrets and they're flying around looking for I suppose some, maybe some buffalo, some elephants, some all sorts of things. What have I just found? I've got a worm for you, I'm going to try and capture it. No, come here. While you look at them fly, I also want to take you. You don't want to be in the car, caterpillar. Come on. Up you go in my hand. Cool, look what I've got for you. Oh no. It's a wriggly worm. Hey. You gotta be quick. No. I've put it on my phone so that you can see there's a rhino in case we don't see one today. And that's a little caterpillar that somehow ended up in the car. And look how beautiful it is. 
black with yellow. It's going to go onto the front of my phone now. Sorry, there we go. I can't stop it from crawling. I don't really want to touch it because it's got long hairs on its body and those could make me a bit itchy. So we won't be... Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> it's now on my hand and my hands are very dirty. I'm so sorry. I've had a very long day out in the bush today. They're covered in mud. Oh, no. What a disaster. I've got to do a bit of a rescue mission now. The, the lions are sitting over there. The caterpillar is under my shoes and I hope it doesn't crawl in my shoe or up my shorts. So I'll try and rescue it. But I'm going to send you down to South Africa with Scott who's driving around. And I hope he gets to show you a spotted cat. Hello everyone. Welcome back. We've made it to the waterhole that we were hoping to find some elephants or buffalo at, but all we found were a pair of Egyptian geese and a few other birds who enjoy living along the water's edge. There's a comb duck over there lying on the edge as well as a couple of blacksmith lapwings. And I wish I was a duck on a day like today. I would be swimming around this pond non-stop. And I'm actually very surprised that it's not doing just that it's very very hot this afternoon now it's not to say that there aren't ele elephants that aren't going to come and have a drink a bit later on but i think we're probably going to move on and check one or two of the other water holes we've been parked here for about five minutes now and haven't heard any crashing branches or sounds of elephants nearby so we're guessing that there aren't any too close what a Senzo spotted there. Okay, there was an impala, a little antelope that obviously disappeared behind those bushes. And maybe they'll come down for a drink. Ah, oh, there's one there walking into frame. And another one, the first one that sends a sp saw a spot popped out. Now what's interesting is that the impala you get here are much smaller in terms of their horn size than the ones you get up in Kenya. So keep note of how these, are, these one's horns are probably only a foot wide at the top of the horns, whereas the ones up in Kenya will probably be about two feet wide at, between the top two tips. So it's a different subspecies you get up there. Very good. We just got a question through from Dominic. I think you would like to know what is the best time to do birding, if I got the question correct. And basically, it all depends on the area you are in, as well as the birds you are hoping to find. Um, water birds can often be seen for kind of long periods of time in and around swamps or, or ponds like this but as a general rule the early morning and late evening are your best times for any kind of wilderness activity and game viewing be it birds mammals reptiles i think most animals like to move in that kind of dusk and dawn period and at least that's when i've noticed my best results of course there are some outliers that like moving in the middle of the day and some interesting things do happen in the middle of the day like elephants coming to swim in ponds like this when it is very hot but the early morning and late evening i think are certainly going to be generally your best bets especially for birding very good well we're going to send you from this black Lapwing, who's only a foot off the ground, all the way up to Kenya with Ralph, who's got one of the giants of Africa. Yes, thanks, Scott, and uh, it's it's definitely one of the the giants of Africa, with it being the tallest of all the mammals, and the giraffe, and this one being a Maasai giraffe. But this one is quite a young one, so it's not an adult. It is a little bit younger. And um, 
He's watching something off in the distance there, maybe a little bit nervous, as giraffe can be, because they're also worried about lions and leopards coming to chase them around. Um, but as we shift over, we do have some uh, bigger ones here. And that one is more of an adult, a little bit older than with the one we were looking at before. But you can see the lovely colors of the giraffe quite dark brown with almost a white color in between and here you can see this giraffe has been feeding on leaves off the trees and now it's chewing the leaves it swallows them and then it regurgitates it or uh, gets it back into its mouth, chews it and swallows it down. Now, there's been a question that's come through about how many different animals do we see on a game drive? Well, that all depends because every game drive is different. Sometimes we see a lot of animals if we are lucky and other times it can seem a little bit quiet but that all depends on how much the animals want to show themselves so if they don't want to show themselves and they, they, they're feeling a little bit off then they can also go and hide and much to do inside that thick trees and near to the river so we then sometimes don't see much at all but an animal as big as a giraffe, it's quite difficult for him to hide, so we generally do spot the giraffe. Now, Kendra, you're asking the question, how tall is a giraffe? Well, they do get a little taller than this giraffe that we were that we are looking at at the moment, but they get up to about five or six yards. So it's it's quite tall. We say five five meters. It's more or less five yards as well, and that's a very tall person. Um, if you say that uh, six, uh, excuse me, eight foot is two meters, eight sixteen. 24, we're looking at almost 25 foot. It's really tall. So let's start up. Let's drive along a little bit. Let's see what else we can find. These giraffe have been very nice for us. Now, Josiah, you're asking what do the giraffe eat? Josiah, mostly they'll eat on leaves off of the tree and they do like to eat uh, those small little leaves that we generally see on the acacia or vichilia trees. You know the ones that you would see on the Lion King and what gives you a real impression of Africa? They've got lots of thorns on them, the white thorns and uh, giraffe, that is their favorite favorite food but they will also eat a little bit of grass but they've got to extend their neck down to the ground which is quite a stretch for them so they prefer to keep their head up and they're the ones that are eating the trees leaves right at the top um, because of their long neck it makes it very easy for them to reach to the top of trees now what have we got in the road here that looks like a piggy a very fat one at that and there's some little piglets running behind let's see if we can get a little bit closer oh, that's either mom or dad coming up behind we'll maybe get a little bit closer and be able to have a better view of them they sometimes are quite scared of the cars and they run off quite quickly but let's see if we can have a look there no, they've disappeared off into the grass. Okay, so let's move on. We've got a, another exciting animal on the road, and that is a crowned crane. Come and look at this bird. It's a very pretty looking birdie, that. Have a look at that, guys. Now, Julia, you're wondering, uh, do the animals eat the grass? Is it always so short? 
Well, uh, Julia, it depends. When we have a lot of the zebra and wildebeest around, they do tend to keep the grass rather short. And if we listen carefully, we can hear this crane doing his call with his little neck movement there. He's probably calling his mate or his girlfriend. And yes, the animals do tend to help keep the grass quite short, but each year we do have new grass growing after the rains have come. And that's a lovely bird. You know, these birds, they move through the grass. They do make their nests in the grass. All right, so we're going to watch this crowned crane, one of the ground birds, for a little while longer. But while we do that, let's send you over to Taylor and see what she has been able to find. We left our two lionesses because they were fast asleep in the long grass and we couldn't see them anymore. But in a little while, I'm hopefully going to have some more lions for you because I'm going to check a spot where I found a pride. So that's what you call a family of lions, is a pride of lions. And there are three girls, three moms, and seven young cubs. So seven little lions. And I think you would quite like to see little lions, wouldn't you? So we're going to head in that direction and Hopefully we'll be able to show you some more. Maybe we'll see some elephants. Maybe we'll see the elephants swimming or eating or doing something exciting. We could also possibly see some, maybe some more warthogs because those warthogs that you saw with Ralph are very, very cute. And they also like the mud. And the area that we're going uh, to is actually called 4x4. So that means I'm probably going to have to engage the car into 4x4 too to be able to drive through there. Otherwise it's going to be a bit tricky and then I might get stuck. I'm the queen of getting stuck in the mud too. But maybe my friend Maurice, the elephant, will be able to help me. Because elephants are big and strong and I reckon he'd probably be able to pull me out uh, if I asked him very, very nicely. Sometimes it can be a bit of a, I want him to hear it, a bit of a grumpy pants. So we'll just see. Maurice, are you going to be excited today? I'm going to put him back in his little... This is where he lives, there and in my camera box, where you can keep out of the rain. <laughs> so, we'll keep driving around and having a look here. I see some cars moving about, so maybe there's some lions. Scott is down in the heat of the Savi sand, searching for all things big and small. Maybe you should tell him what animal you'd like to see next. Well, we came racing away from a waterhole to the area that these impala are in, and we could hear from about a mile away their loud, their loud snorting alarm call, pff, 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 which they would ordinarily let out once they've seen a predator. Now, as we arrived onto the scene, they started calming down. So I'm not too sure if whatever predator was slunk off once it was detected because ordinarily a lot of the times predators will like to try and get away before more animals are alerted to their presence but we are gonna keep looking around here hopefully we will be able to find a leopard maybe lying in the shade nearby here even though the impala have stopped a calling it doesn't mean that the predator isn't here somewhere and what's important to remember is that once the predator has been spotted and it loses its elements of surprise then it becomes almost impossible for most predators to catch their food so as soon as the impala saw I'm guessing a leopard they would have started shouting and then the leopard would have thought, okay, let me give up and move out of this area. But I just want to make sure the leopard's not here somewhere. I could be wrong, and maybe the impala just had a bit of a false alarm. 
I can also just make sure that there's no leopard tracks on the ground. So it's not only our ears we use, but also our eyes to make sure that we can find any tracks or signs of where these animals may have gone. No immediate sign of any tracks here. Bosbo, you would like to know why is it that the Impala have got such long horns? Well, a lot of the antelope have got horns, especially the men, and it's for fighting over ladies. And that's the main reason why the antelope do have horns. It's not really to defend themselves against predators, but from time to time, they will be, or certain species actually will use their horns to try and def uh, defend their youngsters that might be caught by a like, leopard or cheetah. It was so exciting rushing into this area when we heard those alarm calls. And I'm quite sad that we haven't come up with a leopard, but it's not over yet. Hopefully, there's one sneaking around in this thick bush somewhere, possibly up in the trees ahead of us on a hot day. This leopards will like to hang out in the trees because there's a bit of a breeze there. And that's their favorite tree to sleep in, or this kind of a tree. It's called the marula tree. And the reason why it's one of their favorite trees is because it's got these very big horizontal branches. So once they've climbed up, they can lie on a nice horizontal branch. They're quite thick and comfortable. So it's always important to search up in the trees for leopard, down on the ground, and in all the places you're really feeling lucky. Monica, you'd like to know if uh, Ipala are related to deer and no, they're quite different to deer in that uh, we don't have any deer that live in Africa. We have lots of different types of antelope and gazelle and one of the main differences between deer and antelope and gazelles is that deer will have antlers, not horns, and those antlers grow every year for the males and then they fall off at the end of the rutting season and then they regrow the next year even bigger than the year before. But for our antelope and gazelles, their horns will grow quite slowly throughout their life and they will never fall off. And it's quite a different material and substance that, is ma that makes up the horn of our antelopes compared to the antler of your deers. So they look similar, but they're quite a lot different. I guess a pronghorn would be a kind of a antelope that you guys get in America. That would be similar to some of our African antelopes. And it's one of the fastest antelopes in the world, the pronghorn. I think it is the fastest, possibly. Ah, Luke. You ask a questions that the impalas wouldn't like to hear you asking <laughs> because they get eaten by just about everything. Luke, Luke was wondering what do uh, what eats impalas? Lions, leopards, cheetah, even some birds, some big eagles will catch baby impala. Some of the smaller cats that we get in this area called caracal and serval, which is kind of like a bobcat you could say. Uh, um, they will also be able to catch impala. Pythons, big pythons, big snakes catch baby impala from time to time. Who am I forgetting about? Crocodiles. <laughs> so in, the impala is probably one of the most successful antelope in this area, Luke, which means we see more of them than any other. And because they're not too big, and not too dangerous for the predators to catch, you tend to find a lot of different predators eating them. So don't wish that you were an impala unless you want to be permanently afraid that something is going to eat you. See, now I can hear a squirrel alarm calling. What is going on here? We're going to have to do some off-roading. The combination of the Impala's alarm calls earlier, plus these squirrels, and I can hear two squirrels now alarm calling, not just one. Hold tight, everyone. And 
while I work our way through this thick bush to try and find what I'm guessing could be a leopard. We're going to send you across to Taylor who's found another predator. Look at what we've got. We've got jackal pups. They're like foxes, I suppose. And they're surrounding the car. It's the closest I've ever been to them. This is really, really, really cool. Look. Look how close we are. And they are so relaxed. Now, normally, they're very, very shy creatures. And they just want to sit here. There's another one walking there. But this one is probably the best one. No, now we can't even, can't even see it. It's so close. <laughs> I'm just joking. I couldn't resist doing that. <laughs> Look at it. They are so cool. And these are youngsters. So they're just getting to the age now where they're going to be leaving home. They're very curious. They're going to start hunting for themselves and scavenging. Oh, that's a big yawn. Are you ready to go to bed? Well, I think this one has probably been sleeping for most of the day. Oh my gosh, they're everywhere. This is so cool. I've never had, there's three of them and they basically have surrounded the car. One's gone behind, the other one was next to us and then there's the third one just walking around. So they'll be eating lots of different things from grasshoppers to crickets to frogs to rats and mice and then they will also scavenge. So if, if a lion or something has killed a big animal, then once they're finished, they will go in and try and eat the leftovers. I think something is biting this little jackal at the moment. So these are black-backed jackals. And they're a couple of months old, probably around... Oh, did you hear that? Very excited. Very keen on hunting as well. That sounded just like a dog. <laughs> this is so cool. I've never seen a jackal do this before. Aren't you guys precious? Now, Dan, you're wondering if there's a jackal wolves, but uh, that was many, many years ago. Look how curious it is. Oh, it's a pity that's as far as the camera can go. Let me quickly try and reposition. Let me see if it's going to come out again. This is amazing. They're all, they're all behind us at the moment. I don't know if I want to start the car though, because I think I'm going to scare them. And this is a very special sighting to have them so close. Let's see if they're going to come around again. I think they are. Let me just check around here. We've just got to keep looking. But they live around here. Okay, let me quickly turn around. Now I've also got a fly biting me. Can we do this? There they are. Oh, there's four of them. There's not actually three pups. Whee, sorry. Here you can see us in the car. Hello. <laughs> Look at us. There's me waving. And there they all are. This is incredible. This is really a special moment out here. Now, I'm very lucky because I get to see lots of these animals all the time. Regular viewers are very, very excited to be watching this with all of you uh, who have joined in from the schools today. Oh, another big yawn. They're just acting just like dogs. I think they're being a bit naughty because I wonder where mom and dad are. They won't be too far. Uh, they'll still be looking after these youngsters. They haven't quite uh, packed their bags and getting ready to leave home. They're just a bit curious and they won't stay in the den when they're told to stay in the den. So that's where they would live. And their den or, would be a type of a burrow that another animal would have dug. Now, Martin and Angelina, as this little one creeps up closer, you're wondering what do the jackals eat? So I was talking about it just a moment ago. From frogs to insects to rats and mites, they scavenge on carcasses, and they can also eat fruit, too. They actually eat quite a fair amount of fruit, which makes them so special. This is precious. They're so curious. Now, I think they're so relaxed because they see vehicles on a regular basis. I'm going to do an illegal maneuver and take one picture because that is too precious. I have to take one more because it was overexposed. Now it's turned around again, but it looks at me again. I've never seen jackal this close. I did have a really cool encounter where they did, one ran up to me, but these guys seem to be enjoying our company. 
Now, Layla, you're wondering why is this jackal's ears twitching? It's probably because of the insects. There's lots of flies around at the moment and they bite. They've been biting me all afternoon and they, of course, bite the jackals and the other animals too. So by twitching their ears, that actually just gets rid of them. And you can see their muscles on their body are also twitching again. It's just to try and get rid of the flies. Just like some animals will use their tails as fly swatters. And they can do that with their body too. Oh, wow. I hope no one comes speeding down the road, because this is a, a main road. Ah, oh, what a wonderful sight. You can see they're just starting to get their adult colors now too. You can see that black coming through on their backs. Now, Alave, you're wondering if you can keep a jackal as a pet. I've never had one before. I'm sure you could keep a jackal as a pet. Uh, You'd have to get it some vaccines though because they can carry rabies and some nasty viruses and diseases. So you, you'd probably have to keep, well, take them to the vet and get all those injections. But to be honest, I wouldn't want to have a jackal as a pet because they don't belong in my home. They belong out here in the wilderness. I'm sure they would easily domesticate, but it's better that we just leave them out here where they belong. This is very cool. What an awesome sighting. And to see so many jackal pups of this age too. I mean, normally they have between two and three. They can have a few more than that. But the chances of them surviving are very little. Now, Rylan, you're wondering how many jackals are in a pack? Well, normally just mom and dad that live together. And then they'll have some youngsters, like the pups that we can see now. But once these guys get a bit older, so normally at about six, seven months old, they'll actually leave the adults a little bit older than that. Maybe up to eight months, they'll hang around. And then they'll go and start their own family somewhere else. So they don't live in big groups like wild dogs do or wolves do. Uh, they are quite quite solitary, other than, or they'll, they'll live in a pair. What have they found? See, something's caught their attention. I wonder what's moving through the grass. Look at those very happy tails wagging about this afternoon. Oh no. Must be maybe a grasshopper or a frog. Something's biting them. I hope they haven't come across an, an, an ant's nest. That would be biting them too. Now, UJ, you're wondering how do jackals hunt? Well, they run through the grass and then they will pounce on their prey so they'll leap up like a fox does basically if you've seen how foxes hunt jackals do very much the same thing and then if they're scavenging then there's no technique involved or sometimes they have to be a bit sneaky if they're trying to feed around uh, main road and ruin fighting we need to reposition quickly okay mm -hmm. I'm not going anywhere at the moment. Okay, I'm going to try and turn around very quickly so that we can get another view of these jackal. Rolf has got my favorite animal in the whole world. Yes, and it's also one of my favorite animals, the elephant. Always fun to watch them. They are very clever animals as well as being very big and sometimes very playful as well. Look at these two young elephants having a, a good play fight. We all love a good play, don't we? And these elephants are in the marshy area in the grass and so it's very wet under their feet and it's been very wet for us driving in the grass as well. So we've got to be careful not to get stuck and we've had lots of fun trying not So I feel a little bit like these elephants do at the moment. Now, as Archie comes out you're going to see how many more elephants there are. It's been great to watch. Now, Julia, you're wondering where elephants are in the food chain. That's grass. So that makes them herbivores. So in the food chain, they would be one of your first 
animals after the producers which is the plants and then you have elephants and antelope and lots of other animals such as the lion the leopards who eat herbivores now remember that elephants yes they are very big but sometimes they can also get eaten by lions especially the small ones so they're in that part of the of the food chain and after that comes your vultures and your hyenas who help to decompose uh, carcasses etc hyenas can be decomposers but they can also be uh, carnivores um, which which would fall part of the predators as well so they can be a little bit of a mix but vultures they are always uh, part or the ones after predators because they don't hunt for themselves they either eat animals that have died or animals that have been killed by lions or leopards or any of the other predators and in front here we also do have uh, a couple of pretty birds that are hunting in the that might be found in the grass and in the marshy areas so sometimes for frogs and for tadpoles and these are black-headed herons so watch him he might stab away that one in the middle sometimes they move their neck from side to side oh look the one looks like he might have spotted something uh, let's see maybe he spotted something it's moving forward it's almost like an arrow that head of his and he'll use that to spike whatever he's trying to catch and there's three of them now they're all trying to catch some food some dinner at the end of the afternoon because later they'll also be going off to roost because they will only be hunting during the day and at night they go off to sleep and that's the time when the predators normally wake up and start to oh there's one there he got something uh, he was lucky on that strike starting to cool nicely now it's been very hot i think i've got myself a little bit sunburnt but uh, we'll see how we feel this evening i'll have to have a cold shower spend the whole day out trying to find some special sightings for you and uh, we did find a very special um, scene with the lions and the elephant with the warthog kill so that was very fun indeed and if you'd like to have a look at the action broadcast you can um, have a look at hashtag safari live and have a check for that as uh, it was quite a scene earlier this afternoon okay so i think let's move on a little bit very tranquil here but uh, we might have a little bit more fun here in the mud it's been one of those days where we've been throwing mud around and luckily haven't got stuck just yet but um, you never know it might happen now i uh, I am quite good at 4x4ing. I have been doing it for many years, so I do know how to drive in the mud and the wet, but everybody gets stuck sometime, <laughs> and I've been stuck many times before. That's why I know how to drive a little bit better, because I've made lots of mistakes while I've been driving in the, in the mud and in the rain. Alright folks, while I continue here trying not to get stuck, let's go over to Scott, who uh, I'm not sure quite what he's got, but hopefully something quite exciting. What it looks like, that tree that you can see bending down at an angle is about to be pushed completely over by these elephants. And it sounds like you guys are getting spoilt on safari this afternoon. Ellie's up in Kenya. Ellie's down here. And a black-headed heron hunting. I'm told unsuccessfully, however. 
and these guys are just taking it easy, enjoying the snacks as they go along. Elephants are definitely one of Africa's biggest eaters and they eat throughout the day. Basically whenever they are moving they are feeding. They are quite unique like that. There's not many animals that feed on as much as they do. And they'll be quite fussy. Even though they feed on huge amounts of food in total every day, on average 4% of their body weight and for some of the big females in this herd they'll weigh about four tons so they'll be eating about 160 kilograms of food every day that's about 400 pounds so we've got another that's because she's got lots of mud coated over her so they would have been enjoying a mud wallow a little bit earlier on before this baking hot African sun dried them out. Here we can see this individual a little bit better. Clearly got quite a lot of mud caked on his skin. And it's definitely one of my favorite things to watch. Sadly, they're not too close to a water hole here, so it's going to be a while before they have a mud wallow. But on a hot day like this, they could have three or four mud wallows easily. Couple of youngsters in the herd as well. No tiny time. Years of age. They grow quite slowly compared to a lot of the other animals that get born out here. Oh, it's going for a drink. Well, at least it was trying to. It doesn't seem like Bomb thinks it's a good idea. take a long time to develop just like we do they live for a kind of similar period as we do around 60 years in total how cool is this she's right here probably only four or five meters in front of us and it looks like she's feeding on some small acacia saplings called knob You can also see a stripe of mud across her face there where she would have been using her funny long nose, called a trunk, but it is their nose after all, to fling mud all over her body. Hello. What? Smelling a predator here. This is the same area that we did have the Impala alarm calling a little bit earlier. So maybe that's what they're catching wind of and that's what's bothering them a little bit. Hello Tatiana, you would like to know why there's so many dead trees and trees that have been pushed over here? Well, that is thanks to the elephants. And there you can... in the short term and that it kills any tree that they push over it doesn't always kill them but often it does what that does is it creates a safe area for little baby trees to germinate from their seedlings and then start their life with a little bit of protection from other herbivores or who knows even other elephants so it's a necessary destruction and by them breaking down a few branches, they're not only creating, or trees, they're not only creating homes for other little plants to grow, but they're also creating little homes for small animals like insects and rodents. Who knows, maybe a leopard could use a pushed over tree as a den site to stash away her little cabin. And it just makes sure we don't live in too much of a jungle out here, so. Like everything in life, or like most wild places, each animal has got their role to play, and even though some roles may not make sense to us as humans, it definitely does make sense for the ecosystem as a whole. The areas would become too thick, and lots of the animals that need grass to feed on wouldn't have those little open grassy plains that are kept open by the elephants. Well, Miss Brady's
elephants are very lucky. They're one of the few animals out here in Africa that don't really have to worry too much about being eaten by lions or leopards and or cheetah. Those are the three big cats we have out here that would be most likely to cause trouble. examples of where lions have attacked elephants not only baby elephants but kind of medium-sized elephants but it's very few and far between so for them to stay safe all they need to do is stay by their mother's side and who, even if they do get lost their mothers are so so protective and caring of them that they will often make sure they do everything in their power to make sure their youngster is safe and sound so elephants are very lucky in that they're huge huge animals and size and power is one of the things that commands a lot of respect out here in the animal kingdom and if you are big and strong about 250 kilograms whereas a big elephant bull will weigh 6,000 kilograms so four six so it's 24 times the size of a big male lion which means 24 times more power and 24 po times more stuff well uh, say goodbye to the schools and it's been absolutely wonderful how Answering your questions and keep going on safari with you guys so thanks again and we will see you all next time so yes everybody I would like to just show you a very good example of an elephant bull in must now this is a stage in their life it, it, it happens um, mostly bi-monthly uh, uh, sorry um, fortnightly every two weeks or so they come into must and um, you can see the wetness behind his back legs now this bull the way that he's standing you can say, see the way that he rolls his trunk around um, he has been quite aggressive to a few vehicles already now everybody now is give, giving him his distance because anybody that comes anywhere near him he's literally just charging at so he's in that stage where you do not mess with this guy no matter what now we've stopped literally probably about 300 meters away from him and if around and drive away because I know that he means trouble and these are one of the animals on foot that we generally try to avoid them and breeding herds with tiny little babies um, it depends on every situation obviously sometimes you can't avoid them and sometimes they can be quite relaxed as well it all depends on the day and on the situation but clearly today with him being in must he's a very uh, aggressive he's not happy at all and anybody that comes near him is gonna get it so luckily everybody's giving him his space and nobody will get hurt if that is maintained but it is a necessary evil this is what drives him to go towards the breeding herds and go looking for females but it also does make them very naughty and sometimes very aggressive so we've just got to remember that and those are the little things the little signs that we need to look out for as guides and as custodians of the bush and we need to try and tell other people about it because maybe then people might just think why is this animal just being so aggressive towards me but he's doing it for a particular reason and if you look at the signs and you work it out and you stay out of his way when he's in this frame of mind and then everybody is fine and everybody is happy so look he's not going to be happy because of that testosterone pumping through his blood now it's it's almost like as if you had to take 
steroids and go to the gym and pump iron and then you know it's just you're so built up that you start looking for a fight now I'm not saying that any of you do that I'm just saying if you had to Now, Wendy asking the question, at what age do they stop going into must or being in must? Um, Wendy, it pretty much happens right through their life. Um, and, and it's around 50 years old when they start to sort of slow down in that sexual activity. And it, it, the only thing that inhibits elephants is literally their teeth. They get their last set of teeth at around 50, 55 years old. And once they test enough um, energy from that vegetable matter. And so you start seeing them passing whole sticks and branches and leaves, etc. Now, folks, if, if Archie can just have a look at the way that he's walking towards us. He is still doing that big saunter that the elephants do when they're in must but he hasn't taken uh, an amazing interest in us so i'm going to spin around and in the meantime let's send you back over to scott in south africa Well, I certainly do love seeing big Ellie bulls, especially when they're in must, because you do have a chance of seeing them act in a bit of a mischievous way, which is always entertaining, and it's always... must bull will be in. What's for certain is that these elephants here are certainly not in any way mischievous. They have been completely relaxed... tasty large fruited bush willow that they've all been snacking on and they continue to snack on what's been quite interesting is that a lot of them have been kind of almost regurgitating partially chewed up bits of these leaves and then blowing it all over their body if we zoom in there well done Senza you may see a few little flecks of green the angles not quite right and the one elephant's ear keeps popping into the way but they kind of look like they had been covered by a green spray paint almost awesome stuff now that one on the ends taking a bit of a dust bath Lucy, you'd like to know if elephants ever get blisters on their trunks. Not that I've ever seen. Um, they've got incredibly thick and rough skin that I'm fairly certain will only be blistered by the most intense of temperatures. But even when they're ripping off leaves, off branches, we would get kind of the equivalent of a rope burn, but they are unaffected. Seems like these guys are all really enjoying just relaxing in the shade now. This closest one to us here just started doing this kind of spray painting of little leaf particles all over its body. There we go. It's kind of just like they're just like blowing their nose all over their body, essentially using their body like a big tissue. <laughs> It's just so awesome seeing them going about their business when we are so, so close by. And I think what kind of helped us with the sighting is that we got... ...join us here. It wasn't like we intruded on them. So I think that's what's allowed us this epic, epic sighting. and their trunks and their behavior and their individual personalities so this is a great way to be spending a hot afternoon sitting in the shade with some elephants pt waters you would like to know 
come across a beautiful lady elephant. It's a bit of a strange one, PT Waters. It, it, it happens once or twice a year, I'm told, to any given bull that's gone through adolescence. And it lasts from anywhere between two weeks and two months. But I don't think they have too much say in as to when it happens. It can't be triggered for a few days when it suits them and then switched off. I think it just kind of naturally happens. And then they make the most of that period or they make a fool of themselves during that period where they often don't have the best manners and probably convert less attempts than they would when I think it just ensures that during those months of the year there are some very, very interested elephant men who are taking the next generation and making thereof very seriously. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. What's interesting is that these elephants have just turned around on their heels and are heading back in the exact same direction they came. day because it's uncommon to see animals come in one direction and then just move straight back out but maybe we'll try and loop up ahead of them a little bit later we're not too far from another waterhole but it'll take them about 20 minutes or half an hour to get there if they do in fact carry on in that direction well, wonderful stuff well we're going to leave them be that was an epic sighting thank you ellies and we are going to be sending you up to kenya with taylor You are back with us in Kenya now, and I'm going to play a song, but I'm trying to wait for it to load. Come on! It was working so well right now. Look at that massive cloud just starting to form over the top of the escarpment. That is huge, 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 huge. Let's see if the song will load, because it's perfect for what we're looking at at the moment, and of course it's not working anymore. Typical. Absolutely typical. <laughs> Let me turn my Wi-Fi off. Let's try this way. Maybe it will work now. Yes. <laughs> and that's all you get. <laughs> My favorite movie in the whole world. Uh, every single time I drive this forest road, I think of Jurassic Park. So I love the Jurassic Parks. I wanted to be a paleontologist for many years growing up. I used to excavate dinosaurs that were like in Plaster Paris. It was one of my favorite things. And yes, and if you want to know what my favorite movie is, just because, you know, why not? It's The Nightmare Before Christmas by Tim Burton. I love all of Tim Burton's films. He's a fantastic director. Uh, so yeah, so Manu was just saying now he's going to have to go home and watch Jurassic Park. I think that's what I'll be doing tonight as well, is, is falling asleep to Jurassic Park. Oh, if I don't sleep then, well, at least I'll have some dinosaurs to keep me company. I might try, we need to get the surround sound on and I'm going to watch it at 3 o'clock in the morning and terrify whoever is in my row of tents. <laughs> Can you imagine some of those dinosaur noises? <laughs> Linda, you said that that was absolutely majestic. I can't take any credit for that, unfortunately. <laughs> but that do that has a that movie has the greatest soundtrack ever. All the music that comes from it is is quite spectacular. Now we're just very slowly bumbling along the forest road, looking for any animals. Did Ralph tell you about that elephant bull that he just had in Mast? How we watched it chase two people around. I got out of there very quickly because I, I, we were in that sighting, we were quite close to where the jackals were, and then when that bull started charging at everybody, I thought, mm, no, 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 we'll just, we're not going to sit and wait. <laughs> we'll get away from here. Uh, I think it sent some of the cars scattering. I think I got a bit of a fright, and and it's, I like it when sometimes things like that happen and nobody gets hurt because it's just a reminder, and it's the biggest problem with guides, and I'm guilty of it too. All of us are, we become too complacent around the animals which is a problem. Uh, you have to remember that they're wild and that they are, well, they can be unpredictable. Obviously, we're trained at animal behavior, so we should be able to pick up some very subtle signs of agitation. 
and respond to it accordingly. Uh, but if you don't, then that's how you get yourself into a bit of trouble quite quickly. And elephant bulls and must are no fun to play around with. Actually, any angry animal is no fun to play around with. But look how dense the forest is in here. And another thing. Okay, to the southeast. <laughs> now, Scarlett, you're wondering if I could be any dinosaur, what would I be? A velociraptor, obviously. I think those things are insane. Well, the way that they depict them in Jurassic Park is pretty cool. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'd like that. I'd like to have velociraptors as guard dogs too. I don't think I'd ever have a security problem uh, if I had a couple of those. Know, what would you call a pack of pack of uh, velociraptors? I don't know. Squadron? Maybe a squadron because of the way that they move. Um, but yes, I feel as though I was born in the wrong lifetime. I would love to have seen... Uh, dinosaurs when they were roaming the earth that, that it gives me goosebumps they are such amazing creatures well they were such amazing creatures but there's no birds in here which would have been nice seen as though we were talking about dinosaurs that would have been quite cool to see an arena trogan or perhaps an african emerald cuckoo just sitting about the trees calling but the forest seems to be on the the quiet side. But seeing as though we're talking about uh, dinosaurs and we've got Jurassic Park on the brain now, let's hop on board Rolf's car and find out what prehistoric creature he would have loved to have been. If I was a dinosaur, I would be a Brontosaurus. I do think they're quite similar to elephants, gentle giants. Um, herbivores and friendly to, to all around them. So I think a Brontosaurus would have been a good one. But I think Velociraptor, that's quite a good choice of tailors flying around. And. Uh, Yes, well, it's quite, it's very interesting to think about the dinosaurs and what, what the world would have looked like if they were still around and if we would indeed still be around. I, um, it's quite difficult to imagine the massive, sheer scale of the size of the animals that actually used to roam the earth. How things have changed. We got it go around here sorry it seems like a little bit of rally driving today but we've uh, we've been trying to explore different areas and invariably I've been landing up in, in quite tricky spots that need to take a little bit of evasive action there's been lots of holes lots of uh, lots of wet muddy tracks but uh, we've had a thoroughly enjoyable day and it's not over just yet. I'm still hoping to, to find some predators or some black rhino here. We've, we've been hugging the, the forest and quite thick vegetation here. And when I came over in the hot air balloon, we did see a rhino with a baby in, in this thicket right here. So if we are lucky, we might come across them or some other ones, but there, there have been quite a few around and there are some leopards around as well. And they like to frequent this thicker vegetation, not so much out in the open plains like the, the lions do. So as you can see, very wet, hey? Very wet. And you've got to have your wits about you when you're driving through this stuff, because as soon as you lose momentum, you land up sinking in, but you need to keep just the right amount of speed so that you're not plowing into the mud. You just want to float a little bit on top, and that's... Uh, see, an indecision is not a good thing either looking which way to go but luckily we made it through not a problem still on the lookout let's not forget please get involved folks throw us your questions and your comments we'll gladly answer
It's cooled down a lot now. It was actually a rather hot day. And I'm sure as Taylor was showing you, it's getting quite dramatic with these clouds building. And they've been building since about lunchtime. And I wouldn't be surprised if this evening sometime we get a, a rather large downpour. As we did last night, I think it was at around 11 o'clock last night that it really started bucketing down. in the afternoon. Which is quite nice. It cools things down because it has been getting rather hot around lunchtime. Head up a little bit here. Okay, so I'm really hoping that I'm going to get lucky here and I hope that Taylor and Scott are also getting lucky with the sightings and while I continue on along nicely like this, I'm going to send you over to South Africa and see if indeed Scott has been able to find anything while I carry on. Some tracks we've found on this road here. So we've just missed her. She could have gone back into our property. The tracks I've seen were tending to go south out of our area of traverse. And what I can do is show you some of the tracks here. They're very, very fresh. On the right-hand side here. So those are... I can see toes in front there. Direction. Now... I can't see exactly what up over there and she would have tried to run away from them and then she's oh, that's the car that's moving I heard a funny noise so she's come along here hang on here choop 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 then the cars drove across the tracks here then more tracks coming along here and let's just try and confirm but hard in in the shady areas it becomes difficult oh no here she goes you should be able to get them I think or the pole might be just in the way but she's crossed over here. Out of our property. Now I drove a little bit further up. She could have crossed back across the road, but no guarantees. Let's just keep driving up there. The stations, uh, these tracks of this Mufazi Ingwe appear to cross south over Gauri Main, just west of Weaver's Nest, but I'm just going to double check she hasn't linked back north. Sorry guys, I'm just listening to the Game Drive channel. Okay, copy. Good luck, Tex. I'll keep coming up to Shabam Junction and then head back towards Chiaos Dam. So it's very important that we communicate with all the guides and keep them updated on what's going on. Very, very good. 
there's no sign of her coming back though. I wonder who it could be, possibly Shadow. And she does have a... I, have, I haven't seen Shadow for whew, probably close on two years since I left the Sabi Sands quite some time back. points earlier this is where my vehicle tracks turned but maybe I'll go a little bit further just to make sure she wasn't trying to get away from these Impala and while we keep trying to s find out where this lady has gone we will send you up to another lady who's on tour up in Kenya <laughs> and we've got a hippo who's twitching its ears at the moment so I played the hippo song just now a milky chance song and then I said do you like the song Hippopotamus? And then Manu very rudely answered. He thought I was talking to him. I wasn't. And his comment was, yes, I've heard the song 40 million times because <laughs> I overplay songs all the time. I listen to a lot of music, uh, not just the music that nature provides from uh, the different sounds out here, from hippos calling to hyenas, whooping lions, roaring and birds tweeting. Uh, I listen to music all the time. I have my speaker on me. 24-7. The only time I don't listen to music is during the show except when I very sneakily play Jurassic Park theme music then I do but this is a beautiful pool this is a man-made dam and I don't think it was necessarily created on purpose I think they were actually digging from here uh, digging soil to use on the roads when they were repairing the roads and unfortunately well not even unfortunately it's just created this massive pool now which the hippos are quite thankful for uh, you can have a bit of peace and quiet. There's three of them uh, that are in here. And I think they've got such a great f uh, view. Manu, you called it an infinity pool. Almost. I think if we get any rain tonight, it will be an infinity pool flowing over the, the edge. It's kind of like the Angama pool. <laughs> now, Mia, you're wondering if you can tell whether a hippo is a male or female when they're in the water. Wait, look at that one on the left. Bouncing right out. It can be quite tough. Uh, it's easier when they're out on land or if you have quite a few hippo together. Uh, you can use size. The male hippos generally get quite big and they get much bigger teeth than the females. Um, it's, it, can, it can be quite, I find it particularly difficult. That, look what, he, what are they doing? We're going to roll around now. I think they're getting quite excited that sunset is on the way and the weather is getting nice and cool which means that they can... Uh, well, they'll probably leave the water and go out and graze on some of this lovely green grass that's all around the Mara at the moment. These hippo are having a good time out here, uh, just because there is an abundance of food. But what we need to do though, Manu, is we have to start climbing this hill, otherwise we're going to be in trouble. And I've avoid—I think I've avoided getting into trouble today, which is rare. Because I'm always—I'm normally always doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. <laughs> so. We're going to go up the escarpment road now. <laughs> um, sorry, can I please have that whole thing again? Uh, Faith, I just missed something there. Ah, there we go. So, it's a question. It is a question, it's not a comment. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> That's my favourite name in the whole world and everyone teases me and I'm Cheryl. I think it was the last time I... I, I spoke to you and the team laughed for hours at the way that I'd said Cheryl. I don't know what's wrong with the way that I say your name. I think I say it quite nice. Everyone says I sound like a Santon Kugel. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a very posh area in Johannesburg and uh, it's where all the moms drive the biggest 4x4s four you've ever seen in your life. But they're all petite and tiny and blonde hair and they speak with an, with an interesting accent from Joburg. So uh, kind of like the opposite as to how Byron speaks. We always tease Byron. Uh, so Cheryl, yes, I would like to guide in an area like Canada. I'd like to guide all over the world. Uh, so anywhere that there is wildlife, uh, I won't be taking people around museums, unfortunately. As interesting as what they are, that's not my forte. I haven't got many stories about, uh, you know, cultural tours versus, you know, doing a, uh, a tour out in the wilderness. Uh, so yes, I would like to go into Canada. I, I'd go, honestly, I'd go anywhere. Like I said, if I can, if I can add all the places in the world to my list, I, I will. I'll take any opportunity that I can get. Okay, let's go up. Buffalo, we're coming through. 
is a resident group of Duggar boys that live around here and they frequent the mud wallows. Sometimes they brave uh, the, well, the steep incline and come up the escarpment, but not all the time. Those hippos though, uh, and then Khumas and his friend often come up into camp, uh, which is a bit scary because we have no fences or anything like that, so any animal can really come on in. And we're just gonna keep driving so that I'm not late today. I think I also saw Ralph somewhere. Oh, Faith is, Faith is directing. Faith is actually saying one was outside her tent. Very nice to have a hippo munching away outside your tent. Uh, we have, oh, the animal antics in camp are fantastic. We're just going to keep passing these buffalo very slowly. We'll have a quick look at them. I'll go into second gear. There they are. Hi, buffalo. Nice to see you guys again. Do you have a good day? Yep. Been relaxing at the spa, I see. I also sort of got to do that. I think both Rolf and I got a little bit of mud on us. There they are. Those, those guys are sitting down, getting ready to brave the night. Be safe out there, although I don't think there's going to be too many animals that want to mess with you lot. Even the lions uh, seem to turn uh, the other way when they see big groups of buffalo like that. They know that it means trouble. But what a great day it's been. I, well, I think it's been particularly fantastic. I've got to see jackals. And it's this morning on the safari, James was actually asking if we could see jackals. And I couldn't, did we see a jackal, I knew? No, we didn't. We had, we, we had them in the beginning and then we couldn't get them on camera because they were shy. Uh, so to have those four jackal pups around the car, that was a nice surprise. We didn't find Scar though, which was also a request from this morning. Uh, but we found plenty other lions. I think in total we saw 22 lions today, which is pretty good going, not too shabby and we got to see cheetah the border boys which was someone else that, or and two other characters that we were looking for didn't find the leucistic hyena though unfortunately uh, so we'll have to try again at some point to see if we can get those leucistic hyena but we've got many more days ahead and we don't have to rush into that okay i'm going to keep climbing up the hill it seems as though Ralph has found one last cat for you. I hope he makes it to the gate in time. Yes, well, it's a last minute pride of lions. We've been looking for something just to end off our side of things and Luckily, we've managed to find, it seems, I don't know if it's the Angama Pride or the Marsh Breakaway Pride. It's very far away, and that is the camera maxing out. As Archie comes out, you get a little bit of... And unfortunately, it's in a no off-roading area. I've driven a little bit off the road just to give us a little bit of elevation um, but it's literally just a car's width off the road so we won't get into trouble but these lines are lovely to finish off with and um, after this I'll have to be hot footing it up the escarpment and in order to get for us to be able to go out the gate but lovely to finish off with another set of lions as we did start off with a lovely group of lions they were a lot more active than these ones are however they did finish off like these lions are now and um, be interesting to know whether this is the, the marsh breakaway or the uh, Angama pride so um, yes lovely lovely end to a wonderful day and uh, it's not quite finished just yet for everybody and wherever you are in the world I hope you have enjoyed uh, um, our safari that we've been going on I'm still thoroughly enjoying it and uh, now that it's started to cool down at least uh, it's a little bit more comfortable for us so while we sit here a little while longer with the lions I'm going to send you off down south to Scott in South Africa the elephant that was having a mud wallow here will continue to do so but I think he may have had enough you can see he is glistening he's covered his whole body in mud and he's a young bull who's got a bit of an attitude he was kind of like
kicking the mud towards us in the hope that we would get wet and he almost got us I mean I was following droplets of mud that were landing just at the base of the vehicle and we're probably about seven meters away from him so it gives you a good idea of how strong he is now one animal that will be very glad that this elephant is the mud wallow is a terrapin and I can see it it's somewhere just over there where my finger is Seb if you, uh, sends if you zoom in there you I can guide you in uh, left a bit. Uh, there we go, straight in onto that island that's in the center of your frame. Keep zooming. Left a bit. Keep zooming in. There we go. On that little island with a bit of grass on it, there's a tiny little terrapin. And imagine how terrifying it must be being a tiny terrapin with a ginormous elephant slushing, smashing the mud with his feet, trying to create a s softer and muddier s kind of substrate as possible. The terrapin was there. He, I think, has just disappeared behind that little blade of grass. I saw him moving until just before we managed to zoom in on him. But you'll just have to believe me because he was there and so was the elephant and now I'm sure the terrapin is very happy that it's, it's gone. So we continued quite a way along this road hoping, or a road behind us, in the hope that we would find some female leopard tracks crossing back into our property but no joy. I didn't see any tracks. That's not to say she didn't. So what we're going to do is just swing past a water hole. Okay, I've just got confirmation from Tax and another guy that he also only sees tracks going south. So we just missed that leopard. Those tracks were steaming hot. And I'm kind of kicking myself for not looking around a little bit more. We just arrived at the scene a little bit too late and the Impala were obviously looking in the last direction they saw her, but she had slunk quite a lot further west away from that position in order to get away from them before they set off too much of an alarm. It's so tricky. When I heard the alarm calls initially, we were stationary at this uh, little water hole we're going to now. and. It's so difficult to gauge the distance of where these calls are coming from and I mean if we break things down and have a, a very simple example of how the audio from one place can vary greatly is you can imagine if somebody is talking to you from 10 meters away and he is faced towards you like I am now or faced away from you like I am now. I'm having to artificially make my voice lower because there's a microphone in my there's a microphone in my hat. So, but you know what I mean. If so if the Impala were facing away from me, it's going to sound like they're a lot further away than they actually are. Um, so I kind of drove like 400 meters, stopped and listened. Drove another 400 meters, stopped and listened. But by the time I got to the Impala, we had already driven like about a mile. So had I just been able to do that once off, having listening, listened just once. Oh, well done, Senzo. Senzo spotted some tiny little warthogs that we got a glimpse of a bit earlier. I'm guessing it's the same family. Let's just stop here and try and zoom in and get you a view of them. It's going to be tricky. There's only a few small little gaps in these bushes. I haven't given Senzo the best opportunity here. Let's keep moving. I just thought we'd try and bank a visual of them. They're tiny, cute little warthogs. Four of them with their mama. And interestingly, they did seem quite relaxed when we saw them a bit earlier, but they were just in such thick vegetation that we couldn't. Ah, you got a glimpse. Let's keep going forward a bit. <laughs> well, they'll be glad to know that that female leopard is not heading in our direction. Because she would love to snack on one of those. Oh, uh, well, uh, here we go. They are such cute little things. 
and they literally follow their mother's every move. When their mom starts to poop, often they start pooping too, to that level of following, which I find quite fascinating. So you often see a whole family of warthogs pooping simultaneously. to me, I didn't quite catch your question exactly, piglets and how they get eaten and kind of, basically usually a warthog will give birth to four piglets, it's uncommon that you ever see an adult female warthog with four large piglets, the kind of the most I kind of remember seeing are kind of two or one because sadly the mortality rates of them is quite high. Ooh, let's see if we can get this puff back, puffing up its back. It's a, it's something we don't see very often. It seems like there's some birds that's flown off there now, sadly. It seems like there's some birds having a little bit of a debate here. I saw a roller fly off, a hornbill, a puff back, and at this time of the year a lot of birds will be fighting over nesting sites. Now, I'm actually not sure where a puffback nests. I don't think it's in a cavity in a tree, but definitely hornbills and lilac-breasted rollers will, and therefore they will fight with one another over those nesting sites. So yeah, Mia, sorry, you can just, uh, maybe let me know your question again. And I'll hopefully be able to do a bit. Very good. We are going to now continue on. Oh, what a beautiful day it's been. And the sun rise. It was spectacular. Now we get to see it set. Now, this is one of our favorite places, well, the crew's favorite places. Uh, we're not in a triangle anymore. We're actually quite close to where camp is based. And we often have uh, sundowners here. There's big fig trees. There's quite a bit of water that's gathered. And it looks like they're doing a bit of renovating as well. You can see all the rocks have been dug up. Uh, that's just, of course, because we've had big trucks coming through, bulldozers and all sorts of other things, and big grading machines. But this is it's disturbed, and I think what they will do, though, is not most, most of the time is uh, they will brush pack it so they'll get thorny trees and come and uh, put it over all the areas that they've disturbed and then the ground will cover recover better. Manu, what bird is that up in the tree? Straight up above me. Let me go a little bit to the left. There we go on that main, yeah, there we go, you got it? No. What are you? What is that? Hey now. And it made a strange call as well. I'm using my binoculars now because I can't see. Is it, what is that? I don't think I've seen. Is it a? No, I don't. I have no idea what that is. I don't think I've ever seen that bird in my life. That is so cool. Please take some screen grabs. And I've got my camera here. I'm going to try and take a photo very quickly so we can try and identify it. Whether I'm quick enough today, I'm not sure. My camera's not even on the right setting, so no. Hey, how If you know what it is, Tag Safari Live, but that is a new one for me. It's very interesting. Now we can see it a bit better. That's made it much, much easier. It's like behaving a little bit like a starling, in that sort of erratic movement. It's feeding on fruit. So those are two things that we know about it. That's very cool. Okay, well, we'll try and figure out what it is, or perhaps you have or you already know what it is, and you can just hashtag Safari Live and let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be looking in my book, and I'm going to send you back across to Ralph so he can also say toodaloo. Yeah, 
yes, everybody, and uh, we've we've had a couple of carnivores on the on the show this afternoon, and what a fitting way to end our day in the Mara than having the local hyena come out of their den just for us as we cross over to there's a little youngster here next to the road the one that we started off with seemed to be a mother um, because she is heavily lactating and as her mammary glands are very swollen and this one obviously could be a, a little male a lot smaller than the other one could be a youngster as well but um, folks from me I need to head towards the gate otherwise they're gonna lock me inside the reserve so I'm gonna be um, heading towards the gate trying to get out as quickly as possible thank you for joining me on a thoroughly enjoyable day um, in the bush please join us again tomorrow but it's not over just yet I'm gonna be sending you south to Scott and the show continues everyone, we've just been doing some running repairs on a rattling antenna, but it seems to be okay for now. So, you stuck with me for the last half hour, and it's going to be fun. The reason being is because I am hoping we are going to get lucky in seeing Tandy and her little cub. Now we haven't had much luck to date. We've only had two sightings of the little furball so far, the best of which was definitely with Tristan about 10 days ago. And I had another glimpse yesterday morning and no joy since then. So both Tristan and I were out this morning. I was just taking some of the rest of our crew out on a on a drive it was my morning off so none of you would have seen me but i did spend some time at that den site when tristan wasn't there so that if she did come back we'd be able to call him in quickly so he could show all of you but we didn't have any luck we were parked far away just kind of keeping an eye on the area to see if mom came home and she didn't so she was obviously looking for another meal and what's really interesting is that it appears like she actually must have abandoned and that impala carcass um, there was about just the head of an impala remaining dangling up in a tree and it was four days old and I'm guessing that some hyenas did come onto the scene while she was still feeding on it so she would have just presumed that whole kill to be stolen and eaten but it wasn't miraculously the horns had kind of got stuck in the branches in a way that the hyena couldn't get it out of the tree and some of you are lucky enough to watch some hyena dangling from that carcass trying to yank it down from the tree not with any luck though so what we might do is pop into the den site first if and the den site later we'll go to the den first and Wendy you've just said yay Tandy and Cub I couldn't agree more if in fact it does happen if not though certainly we couldn't ask for better prospects to have a leopardess with a tiny little cub on the center of our property is a huge huge blessing and of course we cannot expect to spend every daylight hour with that cub as much as we would all like it's simply not a reality but the chance is there and I'm not sure if you guys all know, all the time that I've spent with Safari Live, we have not had any leopard cubs. When I arrived, there was Quarantine and Kunyuma, who were about 18 months old, so you can't call them cubs anymore. And we didn't have any cubs to view, basically, for the two years that I was here. So I'm dying to spend time with cubs. I mean, I guess a little bit of time with Sindile. Um, but we only started viewing him from about three or four months of age. 
I think. We didn't view him when he was tiny. Yeah. So, then as soon as Hosanna and Shongile were born, um, even though Brent may say otherwise, I was actually the first person to find that den, but I think he may have claimed that. <laughs> um, and I left a few days after that happened, and then you guys had the joy of spending a lot of time with those two leopards and their mother. There's a whole herd of Ellie's up ahead of us, but it looks like they are heading in towards where the Impala kill is. So let's go there and hopefully we'll meet up with them over there. It's taking a lot of getting used to having not only the final control chat to me through this earpiece, but also Is speaking at the same time, the FC's uh, voice overrides the Game Drive channel, which does make sense, but you still have this like mishmash of voices, and obviously having the balance of us talking to you and trying to keep an ear as to what's going on the Game Drive channel, plus having a very little pea-sized <laughs> Getting used to kind of balancing the volume and bit out of is there even lion cubs Nikki's just reminded me we didn't have much luck with in my time here at Juma oh it sounds like there's some hyena getting very excited about something here I can hear some squealing so hyenas are still waiting here very patiently, hoping to get some snacks. But without the help of a leopard, I don't think they're going to get anything. Okay, hold tight everyone, we're about to be in a good spot and it looks like these hyenas are possibly going to put on a bit of a show for us. Now I did hear some high-pitched kind of cackling when we came onto the scene and you can see the three on the right are definitely greeting one another and we'll notice that some will be submissive to the others. Hyenas have got an incredibly complex social hierarchy and it's very difficult for us to, as humans to just come in and know exactly what's going on but what we can expect to see is some individuals acting submissively cowering down to some of the more socially dominant individuals and often with hyena it's not necessarily got anything to do with size sometimes you can see an adult hyena kind of bowing down future who knows possibly that youngster there could be a future queen Well, when the wind blows towards us from the tree that this impala killer is in, it is not a very pleasant experience. And for those of you who have not yet seen the head of this impala dangling from the tree, be warned, as Senzo zooms in, which he already has, you will be seeing some fairly gruesome scenes, mainly of flies, There'll be some maggots in and around the mouth, I'm almost certain of it. Tricky to see, actually. Maggots there yesterday, but they're having a great time, considering that the large predators who are supposed to have cashed in on this kill haven't. So the flies are getting a little bonus meal here. Clearly no sign of Tandy coming back here today. So I think what's happened is, like I said earlier, is that she was possibly up this tree. Let me get my timing right. Was it yesterday evening? No, the day before yesterday. Um, I'm getting confused. But basically she must have been up this tree uh, feeding on the impala when the hyena came into the scene. And then 
she would have moved off and thought, well, the hyena are going to steal everything. She knew that it wasn't high up in the tree, and she would have looked back at them, yanking parts of it down. Um, there was still quite a lot of it left. Um, that was on Saturday night, and today is Monday, so two nights ago. But there was still a chance that she possibly would have come back to have a snack on the leftovers. But... Evidently, she hasn't, which is quite unique. And who knows, maybe she made another kill somewhere else closer by to where she's keeping her little cub. Sorry, guys. My earpiece cable has got tangled up in my back here. So I just need to try and work out what's going on. Sheesh, how did that happen? It's kind of... Buy me some time by focusing on anything you can find. Thanks, Sense. <coughs> oh, there we go. There's the hyena. I'm having a nightmare here. Oh, there we go. Doesn't help that my back is so sticky in this hot, sweaty weather that we're experiencing. Okay, thanks, Sense. But I've managed to get everything ah, <laughs> fixed, kind of, for now. So, the fact that she's not here means she's in possibly two or three places. The den site, that is what we should all be hoping for. B, on the move somewhere looking for a meal, or C, on a meal that she's already made, snacking, getting herself some much needed nutrition before heading back to the den. So those are the three kind of possibilities. Impossible to say which is more likely. It would be so, so wonderful to be able to unobtrusively gain more information into leopards when they have dens because they will vary their behavior a lot and each individual leopard will be different to another whether they've got one cub two cubs or three cubs is gonna because I don't have too much knowledge on that, and I don't think anyone does, at least over a number of female leopards. Philip, you'd like to know whether a hyena that was called Gwen is still alive? Um, Philip, I'm clueless. And her cubs? I heard about them. So in the last few weeks, I heard that there was one young cub, Philip, that was still surviving at a den site. I think it's up on Aubrey's Road. My first two weeks here, Philip, I was assigned to doing a lot of bush walks. So I spent very little time in a vehicle and therefore what was going on with kind of vehicle based things were of no major interest to me. Um, so the last I heard, and that was maybe a week ago, is that there was one young cub still surviving at this den. It appears, for those of you who don't know kind of the background story, not that I'm the right person to be telling you, but essentially it seems like there was two high condition and very thin and emaciated, and it appears like one was either died or was rescued and taken... So not the alpha female, and maybe the alpha female, female, you know, didn't like the fact that the beta female had also had a, a litter of cubs and therefore attacked the beta female. Um, maybe their mother was the alpha female and she got overthrown and the rest of the clan moved off with the new alpha. Um, difficult to be certain, but what I can assure you is that the hyena are a very, very complicated being and they will attack their own species ferociously uh, and often their own, not only their own species, but quite often their own clan members that have overstayed their welcome as rulers. I guess it could kind of be related to Game of Thrones, the humans back then, or in that 
series act much like hyenas. They're happy to put a knife in their relative's back. I'm very proud of myself. I'm trying to teach myself to watch television. And I've been watching Game of Thrones as part of my training. <laughs> And tonight we've got a movie night, so I mean I should get a certificate for TV and movie watching by the end of this month. <laughs> the, the movie we're watching tonight is a secret. We all had a vote out of six movies, and Jared... And now it's a surprise as to what movie... I got onto that. Oh, we were talking about hyenas earlier. Forgive me. I have strayed. But Philip, what we'll do is tomorrow we are both out and about and we will, well I will make it my personal mission to go and find this den site and go and see if Gwen's youngsters are alive and give you a bit more information on that. Brenda, you would like to know if the hyena would possibly uh, be able to track Tandi back to her den by following her scent trail. And yes, they most certainly would be able to do that. Um, and I think that's one of the main reasons why leopards will move their den sites every two or three weeks, because even if it's in a wonderful, wonderful spot, there's a strong, strong likelihood that other predators, not only hyena but possibly other leopard or lion, can follow the scent trail into an area. And of course, if a leopard's backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards into the same area, the likelihood of something snooping in there to find out why increases. So it is possible, but I'm hoping it's not the case. <laughs> just got a wonderful message through and that's from Nick B and you have your bags packed your safari gear all ready and lined up and you are coming to South Africa not just to South Africa but to this very area the Sabi Sands and that is wonderful news if you haven't been before you are in for an absolute treat let me warn you in advance it's very hot at the moment um, but from around now from about 5 30 in the evening six it starts cooling down and I guess it just makes the sundowners taste that much And come and visit before we head out on one of our afternoon drives. What we usually do for our visitor visits is have you guys arrive at 3.30, half an hour before we go live, and that way we can have a chat, show you around, and you can watch the start of the show, if you like, from the control room, and then continue on with your safari. So... Pop us a mail if that's the case, Nick, and we'll be able to fine-tune that. And thanks for letting us know. It's wonderful to hear from you guys all the time, be it questions, comments, thoughts. But to let us know that you are coming to visit is obviously very, very exciting. Scarlet Skies, um, you would like to know a little bit of kind of the behind the scenes, what one or two drinks and just catch up, have a communal dinner and then kind of take it easy. We, it's, dis, it's a little bit disjointed how we uh, 
uh, how we live in that there's uh, the landowner's sister's house so she's got a kind of holiday house here on Juma and there are three bedrooms there so Tristan and Ali stay in one and then the other two rooms one is occupied by Jared and Ashley who are both new members to our crew um, and Jared's involved in the tech side of things and Ashley's involved in the kind of production social media side of things and I think the the third room there people just kind of juggle between and then the DRC which is the name of the other camp where we stay the Juma research camp it used to be a camp that was uh, built for researchers to come in and stay at um, there are about 10 semi-detached uh, little rooms where we all stay and it creates a bit of a courtyard so we're all very close to one another there and we spend a lot of time together for that very reason. We don't have an option to really escape because all of our room, we're all next door neighbors. <laughs> so we do spend a lot of time together, but we are incredibly lucky with our crew. We've got a fantastic crew and we all get along well, especially considering how much time we spend together day in, day out. Um, so yeah, we get up to a whole bunch of different things. Some people like doing exercise during the day, which is a disaster at the moment because it's so hot. I'm just talking quietly because Tundi's den is just up or down to our left, yeah? Um, so yeah, we do some exercise, have our morning meeting after the morning safari, um, have a snooze. I like having a snooze every day, especially here because we wake up very early in the morning. Um, as you are well aware, we get up at four o'clock in the morning. Hit, hit out at five so it's nice to have a little snooze midday it's one of the perks of the job edit some pictures make some videos if it's cool take some of the other guys who don't get it out as much day drive like this morning I had the morning off and I took some guys out on drive rather than sleeping in also to help try give Tristan a hand so I hope that kind of answers your question I mean I can't tell you too much about what we do as I'll give away some some little nasty secrets about us which we need to keep you guys guessing about hmm Okay, well the area you're looking into now is where I was hoping we were going to see Tundi's little ears twitching. But no joy. No sign of her anywhere here. So, I'm guessing what that means is that she's gone off to snack on a kill or try and make another kill. But it was somewhere in and around the root systems of this acacia tree that we saw her and her tiny little cub last. Who knows, maybe she's moved her den site again. It's not unlikely that that's, you know, that could have happened. Let me just drive a little bit back to where we were and see if another angle doesn't help us. It's such a cool spot down here. There's so many hiding places and possible den sites that she may have only just moved a few meters away. And that's something we, we do need to remember. There's a lot of fallen down logs and very good hiding places where she could decide to stash her. And yes, PT Watcher, um, like I did just mention, um, she could well have moved the den sites again. Maybe some hyena came onto the scene, maybe another leopard did. It's hard to be certain. Or maybe she just got a feeling like it was time to move. But I mean, look up ahead here, there's this fallen down tree in front of me. and. Right under there, there's lots of good hiding places where you could stash a cub. So, just waiting for her beady eyes to lock contact with mine once we find her. 
She can be a little bit aggressive, uh, this leopard, even when she doesn't have cubs. So, a good example of how each different leopard will have its own personality. And on top of that, depending on the day, they may be a little bit moody on one day and not so much the next. Oof, no, the sun's not really working from this angle now. We were here in the morning last time. Let me just have a quick look with my binoculars and see if I can't see anything interesting. Even when the sunlight was in our favor, one morning it was very, very tricky to see her at certain times. Hello, Sammy James. You'd like to know... Oh, a beautiful little sunbird. Not a white-bellied sunbird, I think it is. Well done, Sens. Um, Sammy Jane, you'd like to know how long will it take before anyone finds the next den site? Well... It's hard to say. That it's a difficult job for the trackers to actively track a leopardess to her den. where she feels like she needs to attack us so basically um, the only way to do it safely is as and when the leopardess has a kill or she's in a confirmed sighting the trackers can hop off the vehicle and then back track her and try and get to the den sites um, but there needs to be ideally somebody that has a confirmed visual of the mother away from the den site while that happens and that obviously requires a lot of variable tricky at the moment is that um, we don't have Herbie and Rex working for us. They're on holiday and they are our two expert trackers. So we don't really have anyone to go off and do the hard work. And you tend to find that a lot of the trackers get comfortable on those soft seats on the front of their guides' cars so they don't do too much tracking. So... I'm not feeling too confident, but basically what we are rely relying on is we need to follow her back to her den by simply following her. So hopefully we find her somewhere, anywhere, on a kill, on the move. Um, she would like to know how long will a cub stay in the den for? That's when they start feeding, and that's when they are big enough and coordinated enough to be able to climb up trees. And even though it might be a small little scraggly tree, as long as they can climb and get a few meters off the ground, that means they're out of harm's way of a hyena, and means that they could very well get lucky in, in terms of escaping. So they also need to start eating meat from three months of age. They're not going to be getting new. So, I mean, in another six weeks, this little cub, and they're small at three months of age, um, they are going to be completely out of need or not requiring a den site. So I think it's fair to say, on average, the first three months, they will be kept in den sites, stashed away. Thereon, wherever the mother kind of makes a kill, she'll take... ...move... A short distance, whether it's 500 meters or a kilometer, maybe they'll go for a drink. She'll find somewhere to just stash them, but it'll be not nearly as elaborate a den site as the first. It's the first three that they need to be very, very cautious because they're not very good at looking after them. So, two minutes of this would probably be a little bit boring for everyone. Reward, but I think the risk outweighs, not outweighs the reward, but I just think we could. when we come back. 
we will be able to find Tundi and that tiny little furball. Good. Hello, CNAC. You'd like to know what sunbirds are found in the Kruger National Park and... Amethyst sun, the scarlet chested sunbird, I'm pretty sure. Um, the Mariko, all of them now would be a small miracle. So, what other ones here am I forgetting? I'm a little bit rusty on this area, Cenac, especially the birds of this area, seeing as I've been out of here for two years. But there's a whole big bunch of them that you get to see here. And like I said, the Kruger Park is long and thin, so and, and it, it stretches north-south. So there's a lot of different species of not just sunbirds, but all the different birds that you'll see in certain parts of the Kruger that you will not see here. Okay, what to do for the last half hour? Okay, well we've just got a nice suggestion that's come through from uh, from Ashley. As you can see, I'm losing focus here. I nearly drove us straight into a mud wallow. <laughs> Ashley suggested that we find a beautiful spot to enjoy a sundowner and the evening chorus of birds and just chill out for a bit. And I think that's a marvelous idea. So. We will slowly make our way up towards the quarantine clearings. I think we might have to do a bit of a loop though before we get there because we've still got quite a lot of time to play with. So which loop shall we do? How shall we loop de loop here? Hmm. Not too sure which route to take actually. So, we want <laughs> kind of getting a little bit into your, well, at least I do, I that you kind of get used to driving certain roads and you, you've got your roads that you prefer and then you end up just like ignoring certain areas. So I'm going to take us through one of those areas that I've been through default ignoring. Debbie, sadly, no, we are nowhere near the Chitra Dam. Um, we are right in the center of Juma which is convenient because if Tundi's den site was on the fringes, obviously we would be concerned that her and her cub would spend time away from us, which would mean we would see them even less. But that's not the case. Quickly sends, I think, is that the young, young Warburg's poking its head up there? I think it could be. I think we might be able to see a great view. Yes, we can. How cool is that? What an epic view of this young little Warburg's eagle. And we were actually lucky enough to see this guy getting fed this morning. I'm not too sure exactly what its parents had caught it, but one of the parents was standing up on the nest, plucking little bits of what seemed to be a bird and feeding, feeding it to it. As you can see, it's covered in fluff at the moment. Not many feathers just yet. And... I've got no idea how old this little critter is. Its mom's beginning to call now. That's the noise you would have been able to hear. Her mom's out of sight from the angle we're in here. And how cool is this? What's interesting is that 
this uh, nest has been here in all the time that I have been here. They kind of, it might shift ever so slightly, but it's been in the same tree for at least three years that I've been here, and for many, many years before that. The mom's starting to call again. And the, there's a road that is called Wahlberg's Nest, thanks to this nest. So who knows how long this pair of Wahlberg eagle or possibly other Wahlberg's eagle before it, have been nesting here. There you can see the road turning off. That's Wahlberg's nest. And I've been told by Ali this morning that there have been some recorded cases of Wahlberg's eagle going back to the same pair. They have some serious, serious experience and knowledge of this area. Imagine being able to ask them some questions about what they've seen over all the years. There's Mother Bear, or possibly Papa Bear. Relaxing M, yes, a leopard could certainly reach that little furry Wahlberg's eagle chick. And I saw, I mean, I saw a, a leopard, it looked like a young leopard, and young leopards are usually more desperate than older, more experienced leopards, especially as they've been kicked out of home. I saw one climbing right up to a very, very high tree, I'm not sure what the tree was, and eating a baby vulture. And vultures usually nest right up on the top canopy of the trees. So, I mean, this would easily be achievable for a leopard to get to. And let's hope that doesn't happen because it wouldn't be a very nice scene to spec to, to witness. Ah, Susie, you've come. You suggesting baby antelope and the area that I've decided to. is an area where a lot of the antelope like to frequent in the evenings because it's a big open clearing where predators to use as hiding points when they're stalking up on them. So we're heading to some beautiful big open clearings where hopefully we'll be able to see Footloose and Sputnik. Um, Ian, you've challenged me to find a chameleon. Ian, I have been searching on foot during the day um, for chameleons for the last two weeks, walking close past butch bushes, possibly being too focused on trying to find a chameleon and not actually do my job, which in involves finding a whole host of animals, not just chameleons. And during the day it is near impossible to see a chameleon you have to be very very lucky slash skilled to see one the most likely way of spotting one during the day is when they cross the roads but when they're sitting in bushes unless you saw it in a bush with a spotlight the night before it's going to be super tricky so sadly because we are closing down before sunsets at the moment uh, the chameleon hunting conditions are bleak. It's the best at night with the spotlight when they glow, usually a paler shade than all of the green leaves in the tree that they're sitting in. Ah, oh, we've got our first babies. They're not the tiniest, but they are babies. And they are some impala. I think Senzo may have fallen asleep temporarily there. I hope you guys also aren't sleeping at home. If you are, wake up, everyone. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you, Impala. Um, so there's a few babies. guys it sounds like there have been some gremlins on YouTube and you're not hearing everything I'm saying um, so apologies for that um, some of you would like to know how many years exactly will the Wahlberg's Eagles nest for and 
and in any given tree and Jersey lady I'm told that it was a uh Gives you a good idea of the thing they live for, too. Okay. Where are Sputnik and Footloose, two young wildebeest? They've also got uh, two cousins, but we weren't there to see them get born, so we couldn't name them. Tanya, you would like to know if most eagles are monogamous, and yes, they are. Most raptors do form lifelong bonds. What's well, interesting with the pair of Warburg's eagle that nest at that uh, road junction behind us that we looked at earlier is that they are both pale form Warburg's. So I'm guessing the, the, their two genes combined are going to be churning out a lot more pale form Warburg's into this area. Now, have we peaked too soon? I think we may have. We've arrived too early. Because we've still got a little bit of time until the sun sets. And this is our best spot to do it from. So let's do a little bit of a loop. There's a nice little loop we can do through this area. You can see the sun set a little bit high up. And I also hope that by searching a little bit further afield, we might be able to find that little family of wildebeest. There's only about... And there are still another two females that are heavily pregnant, according to Tristan. So hopefully we'll get a few more little juniors born to that herd. And who knows, maybe we'll be lucky enough to see them again. Sadly, the second birth was witnessed with me. that whilst on foot, which is what I was doing, we would film a wildebeest bear. I think we found a leopard on foot, then we saw a wildebeest birth on foot, we approached elephants on foot. I think Tundi made a kill, Jamie's cheetah made a kill, and and Brent's lion, or Taylor's lion, made a kill, Taylor's lion. So that specific two hours went by very, very efficiently and smoothly, but sadly, it was a rehearsal. Ha! Oh well. That's how it goes out on these live safaris. You cannot predict or plan or know when anything exciting is going to happen. Sometimes it all happens at once. Sometimes nothing happens at all. Scarlett, you'd like to know how cool does it get in Juma in the summer months? And not very cool at all um i still need to have a fan blowing on me at night sorry i should have specified at night um, i didn't specify that um i have my fan blowing on me full ball all night and don't use a duvet don't use a sheet less is more Um, the actual temperature, I'm guessing, probably mid to parts. I guess also, uh, probably the rooms we stay in also retain a little bit of this he the heat. Um, this probably doesn't help our cause great. You can walk around shirts on quite comfortably and happily so there's not much of a contrast at all 
winters winters when you get the big uh, contrast in temperature um, the the winter nights can be freezing and especially the early mornings and late evenings when you're driving around on open vehicles but come kind of eight o'clock in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon it's beautiful sunny weather shorts t-shirt no problem it's just the, those first few hours when it can be bitterly, bitterly cold and you'll be covered up in scarves, gloves, everything, lots of layers. And then come the middle of the day, you very seldom have clouds in the sky, wonderful weather. It's a great time of year for us to actually, I enjoy the Sabi Sands in winter. Summer, your window of opportunity to explore is very small, in my opinion, unless you're going out after dark. And going out after dark is complicated unless you've got very, very fancy equipment which allows you to view things without interfering in what they get up to. So the Sabi Sands winter is my favorite time of the year here because you're not uncomfortably hot and you can spend the whole day out on safari. It also means we can also go for lots of joy rides with the rest of our crew, whereas in summer it sometimes just doesn't make sense to. Sadly, I'm probably going to be back up in the Masai Mara for the next Sabi Sands winter. I think the plan is for me to head back up there in March. Ah, Sinak, you're interested. Oh, because Sinak's so interested in birds, I've got to stop this and get it for you. And then if you ever come to visit, I'll give it to you. Actually, you have to tell me that you're going to come and visit. Otherwise, I'm not going to keep this. It'll be a gift. As and when you come. I think I saw something. Ah, I did. Because Sinak is a bird watching enthusiast, I've gathered. I have collected you a feather of a lilac breasted roller, which is French for lilac breasted roller. <laughs> okay, very beautiful colors. And Sinak, you're interested to know about owl hunting. I don't know if you guys saw the colors well. Could you see the colors well earlier? Beautiful. Wonderful. It's all about the angle. How crazy, when you turn the angle, the colors start popping out. So I wasn't sure if I had the right angle initially. Good. So you're interested to know about owl hunting at night. And yes, it's definitely best done at night. You can find owls during the day. Um, you just look for their kind of upright owl-like body shape with those two little tufts sticking up off their head. Um, so you can see them during the day, but it's definitely easier at night when they're moving around. Thanks, Spara, for complimenting my very fancy French. Um, oui, oui. Uh, <laughs> and the owls that you could uh, be lucky enough to see, your Sinak, are the spotted eagle owl, the giant eagle owl, or the rose eagle owl is their new name. And. A barn owl another one that you could see in the evening um, but to be honest not the best place I've ever worked to see owls you see them from time to time here but there's not a huge population of them If anybody of you, if anybody of you, if any... Apologies. Just thought I'd squeeze in a big gulp there whilst the gremlins me. Sounds like there's some issues with 
the feed for some reason this afternoon. Apologies for that. Thanks very much to everyone who had compliments in my... Many of you were wondering. <laughs> You'll be alarmed to hear, Andy, that Brent is now claiming to be the cheetah man of <laughs> And yes, Andy, I am very excited to be going back up to the Masai Mara. Um, I get bored quite easily, to be honest. So I don't think I'll be able to survive longer than three months uh, in the Sabi Sands with the small traverse that we have. So just as well, the Mara is an option for me. And I'm very, will be, well, I am already excited and I will be even more excited by the time the next few months has passed to head back up there. But what must be said is that we are all incredibly, incredibly lucky to be not only here, but also in the Masai Mara. These two destinations really do complement one another so, so well. They're so different to one another and it, it's it's wonderful for, for everyone involved. FC, the cameraman, the, the, the presenters, you guys, and I just hope that we manage to get a few more locations under the belt. to spend like three or four months in a destination and then move on to the next and have kind of like a mobile FC that just follows me around in a Unimog. That's what I would like. It's also what our boss would like. He's got the, the plans from you and your friends. So that's how you can help. Hi, Philip. You say this is your favorite wildlife theme themed soap opera on the internet. And it's probably the only one that gives you daily soapies. So <laughs> thankfully now you're not too spoiled for choice. We, we're your only option, really. But... <laughs> I am glad that you do enjoy what we do because we take a lot of care and pride in it and it's great to have you guys along for the adventure. It would be awfully lonely driving around here with nobody to see or play with. Oh yay! We found the wildebeest including Footloose and Sputnik, two of the new additions. So, what I would like to do is get onto a good spot where we can f view them and also enjoy the setting sun and just have, <coughs> excuse me, a few moments of silence. They seem to be heading into the perfect spot for us to get some kind of silhouetted... the way at the moment. Oh yeah, this could work magically. Huh. Not as magically as I would like it to because there's a few trees in the way now, but let's just stay here. No, hold on guys, we're going to go for gold. Apologies. We are going to try and get you the perfect, perfect spot. You see where the sun's setting now, there's all these bushes in the way. I want to try and get to that clear section there. Get the sun between us and that. Oh yeah, this is going to be good. Just going to have to hope the wildebeest walk, continue walking through the frame, but they should. So the big bull is clearing the pathway for his ladies. He will be the first to pass through that beautiful 
spot where we're going to get their silhouettes. But while he makes his way there, let's take a look at the rest of the herd and all the youngsters, and I'll let Senza know when the best opportunity will be to get them going through the little golden gap that we found with the setting sun. Now, sadly, there's not too many birds tweeting around us, although I sounds of the wild. Four of them still, so still another two to be born, hopefully. And which ones appear to still be pregnant? The one on the back left looks like she could well be to me. She looks like she's got quite a belly on her. Yeah, there's a baby in there. So that's one. The other one that could still be pregnant, I'm not too sure. Maybe the, the front one, yeah, it looks like that one. It's hard to see because she's front on, oh, we just missed the bull walking through the sunset spots. <laughs> anyway, hopefully the rest of the herd will follow suit shortly and we will get some magical, magical views. Come on, guys. Oh, no, now the bull's doing some dust kicking. I need to move. Quickly, Scott. Quickly, 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 quickly. Jason, you're wondering which one is footloose. It's a, it's difficult to know exactly who is who. <gasps> okay. This is going to be beautiful if he does it again. He is going to do it again. He's going to roll around now in the dust. And hopefully when he stands up again, we are going to get some fantastic views of him. Kind of like the stereotypical bull scraping his foot to intimidate their opponents. How beautiful is this? Okay, so I'm gonna start keeping quiet now. We're gonna keep quiet for a minute, turn up all the ambience so you can hear all the sounds and just enjoy a minute of silence and then we'll still have a couple of minutes to chat afterwards. Enjoy. Wasn't that absolutely magical, everyone? I hope you guys enjoyed that tranquil and beautiful scene. Oh, thankfully we called it when we did, because those impalas would have given us all the frights of our lives if we had all been <laughs> watching that sleepy wildebeest just enjoying the sunset after his dust bath that looks like ice. I don't think we could have asked for a more picture-perfect finish with that he's in a spot with his family. Thanks so much for all of your contributions, questions, and comments. It will be another wonderful day to be out on Safari tomorrow, so make sure you don't miss out on the action. Well done to all the team in the final controls, both here and in the Mara. We will see you all next time.